All right, family, your brother Assad, and I am back again with another quick video. So make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and hit that notifications bell so that you'll be notified when we drop new material on this channel. Secondly, in terms of housekeeping, I got to give a special and a significant and a particular and a peculiar shout out to my South African family for all the love you guys have shown this channel, my wife, myself, my children. We greatly appreciate it. Third, bam, 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 just like that. Third, I got to give a special and a significant and a particular and a peculiar shout out to my uh, family who came out today at uh, the African U.S. Cities Conference, where I gave a presentation on uh, the cultural resistance of New Orleans, New Orleanians, Africans in New Orleans to uh, cultural assimilation uh, during their enslavement period. It was a great talk, and I really appreciate those that came out. Now, if I start naming names, I'm going to leave somebody out, so I won't do that. Uh, however, I know there were many people who said, Brother Side, I want to be there, but it's in the middle of this day. Brother Side, I want to be there, but I got to be at work. I got to pick my children up. I got to do this. I got to do that. So I said, you know what? That's fine. What I can do is I can give the presentation right here on YouTube, right? It'll be a little different from our usual content, but for those who wanted to see it and kind of understand what I was talking about uh, today, I'm going to go ahead on and give the presentation and um, put it on out there on YouTube and let you guys who choose to enjoy it, choose to enjoy it. All right. So. All right, family. So we will get started. I want to thank each of you for watching this presentation. This is um, this presentation was uh, in the black history portion of the African Africa U.S. Cities Conference held at the University of Vitz Rand, sponsored by uh, the African Center for the Study of the United States. Now, um, you know, after centuries of enslavement and indoctrination by our former enslavers, our history was forgotten and removed from the records and from the annals of history. Uh, African Americans are the only people, only people group that have had to research and then write ourselves back into history. So for African Americans, Black History Month is not just a month of, of honoring accolades and notable people. It is a way of writing ourselves back into history it is a way of reclaiming our agency, our dignity, and our humanity. Um, uh, in a context in which history is immediately viewed through the prism of uh, uh, Eurocentricity, any discussion on Black history is an, uh, is an act of resistance. And no place on earth, uh, well, let me say no place in the United States has been uh, been an example of cultural resistance through preservation like the city of New Orleans. For over 300 years, this small city at the mouth of the Mississippi River uh, has uh, continued a preservation resistance movement uh, through religious syncretism, the exploitation of the Cold War, and full-out rebellion. I like to remind uh, individuals that uh, it was the area of New Orleans that was the site of the largest enslaved African rebellion in the United States history. So it is my However, I, I, I want to talk today about the resistance through cultural preservation. It is my thesis, it is my thesis that when a Black person from New Orleans says, I am a New Orleanian, they are simultaneously saying, I am an African. So, what will I discuss? This is an overview. Um, 
here are the few topics. I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put them all on the screen and make it easier. Bam, 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 just like that. Bam, bam. All right. So um, first we'll discuss the timeline. When did these Africans arrive in New Orleans? Why did they arrive in New Orleans? How did they arrive in New Orleans? Right. Then we'll discuss uh, a slide that I would like to call the Walmart of slavery and the influences of slavery on New Orleans, as well as the influence of New Orleans on slavery. Secondly, I would like, uh, well, next, I will discuss uh, how the French territory and Code Noir aided in enslaved Africans in New Orleans being able to preserve uh, certain cultural traits, certain cultural traditions. Uh, finally, I will talk about Congo Square. And the second part of the presentation, I will talk about some of the, um, the results of this cultural preservation, jazz music, Ifa and voodoo, uh, the influence of Haitians and how Haitians have contributed to the uh, cultural makeup of New Orleans. Um, and then three very specific items, cultural items that can be traced directly back to the shores of West Africa. And that's architecture, that's food, and it's our funerals. So, um, the first ships carrying Africans to the New World uh, and to New Orleans, the area which is now known as New Orleans, was around 1717, maybe 1718, 1719. Uh, at that time, the area known as New Orleans was under the control of the French. Um, however, the, the insatiable demand for free labor, for slave labor, uh, uh, made the French uh, begin to uh, import more and more uh, Africans into the territory. Historian Gwendolyn Hall, in her work on um, uh, African Americans in colonial Louisiana, um, said that by 1741, Africans outnumbered the French in the New Orleans area four to one. Bam, 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 just like that. New Orleans became super African, four to one. And the French understood this kind of precarious position that they were in. And they knew that eventually they would have to make concessions to these enslaved Africans. So they were outnumbered four to one, and they knew that they would have to make concessions to these enslaved Africans. So when we talk about the Walmart of slavery, um, as the practice of slavery continued in the French territories and in the Anglo United States, the number of slaves uh, grew from 1790 to 1860. The number of slaves went from 700,000 to over 4 million. Uh, in 1795, Etienne de Boer, he granulated sugar in New Orleans, and this caused an explosion of sugar cane plantations. Uh, so within 50 years, enslaved Africans in New Orleans and in Louisiana were producing 25% of the world's sugar cane harvest. Um, and this made New Orleans the capital for two things slaves and sugar. It made New Orleans the capital for slaves and sugar. Khalil Muhammad in the piece for the New York Times called The Barbaric History of Sugar in America wrote, uh, New Orleans became the Walmart of people selling. Uh, the number of enslaved labor crews doubled on sugar plantations and in every sugar parish, black people outnumbered white. These were some of the most skilled laborers doing some of the most dangerous agricultural and industrial work in the United States. Louisiana led the nation in destroying the lives of Black people in the name of economic efficiency. But here's the thing. Because this demand for enslaved Africans was just insatiable. They were bringing in new Africans and new Africans directly from the continent 
into the city, directly from the continent into the city, year after year, decade after decade. What happened as a result of this is that each time these new Africans who came from places like Benin and Senegal and Angola and Nigeria, some parts of present-day Ghana, uh, uh, the Gambia, uh, various parts of West Africa. Each time they brought these new Africans in, they replenished and refreshed the African connection to the continent. So those that were enslaved, if by chance they had began to uh, forget uh, African practices, forget African cultures, forget certain traditions. These new Africans that were coming in possibly shared similar cultural practices and traditions and would remind them and refresh them and reinvigorate uh, their connection to the continent of Africa. So as my big mama would say, what the devil meant for bad, God meant for good. Now, I wanted to put this up here because this is called a broadside. It came out in, it, 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 this is from 1835. And this is a broadside, basically an advertisement announcing the sale of human beings, human beings. So often we just say slave and we kind of uh, disconnect or get so clinically detached like a slave is just a thing. No, these were human beings beings that were being sold. These were husbands and fathers and mothers and sons. They had feelings and desires and aspirations. They had religious beliefs. They got sad. They got happy. They got angry, right? Um, they got hopeful. These were all human beings. They were not slaves. They were people who were enslaved. And I think that is an important designation. So, Understanding the French and the Cold New War. Understanding the French and the Cold New War. So the Cold New War was a brutal set of instructions issued by France that were meant to regulate the practice of slavery in New Orleans and in the rest of Louisiana. So for instance, under the Cold New War, a slave owner could no longer free his slave. He had to seek permission from the superior council. Um, uh, and, and in order for that slave to be free, there had to be extraordinary circumstances for that slave to be free. However, under the Cold New War, there were a few things, the concessions. Remember I mentioned that they had to make some concessions. There were a few concessions that were made. Number one, uh, the slaves had to be converted to Catholicism. Now you say, well, doc, that's not a concession. But as we will see later on, the, the in, ingenious nature of the African kicks in and they were able to use the idea that they were converted to Catholicism in order to preserve African spiritual practices, right? Uh, secondly, um, the French gave uh, enslaved Africans a day off. Every Sunday, they were off. Every Sunday, they were off. Third, um, um, the, the Cold New War outlawed the uh, separation of families, which made it easier for cultural traditions and practices to be maintained with, within the family structure and as well as within communities. So as vicious as the Cold New War, uh, the Cold New War was, it uh, aided in some ways in the cultural preservation of African practices in, um, in the city of New Orleans. So this picture, this picture is Congo Square. So as I mentioned, these enslaved Africans had Sundays off. They had Sundays off. And, and, and it's pretty remarkable the amount of freedom that they had on Sundays. They were able to move about the city without an overseer, without a slave master. I'm sorry, without an overseer, without a slave master or slave owner. Uh, they're looking for them. Um, and this led to uh, Africans starting to congregate in a place that is now called Congo Square. 
Uh, the French called it the, the, the place of the Negroes, right? Uh, in Congo Square, uh, these Africans would meet and they would trade goods and services. Because at the time, there was the possibility that they could buy their freedom. So they would meet in Congo Square, trade goods and services. But not only that, if you look at the picture, they would also drum, right? And if you look at the, the, the right side of the picture, there's drumming, there's dancing, and this young man could be courting a mate, right? Um, also in Congo Square, African spiritual practices and rituals. Uh, continued. Um, so Congo Square becomes the capital of cultural resistance to assimilation into French culture and into Anglo-American culture because this tradition of allowing these Africans to meet on Sunday continues um, when New Orleans becomes a part of the United States. Now, I want you to pay attention. If you look in the background of this picture, you'll see a building to the left You'll see a building to the right with a tall structure in between two kind of smaller structures, right? That is St. Louis Cathedral, St. Louis Cathedral. I want you to keep that in mind because I'm going to come back to it uh, shortly. So St. Louis Cathedral and this dance that is taking place in this, this picture is called the Bambula, the Bambula. So right now I want to... Uh, talk about the um, the Congo Square. I want to talk about Congo Square. So jazz music is born in Congo Square. Um, it is it is the drumming and the uh, uh, banjo and the gourd instruments that are being played on Sunday every Sunday. Uh, that be formulates the baseline, the, the 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 foundation for what is now known as jazz music. Uh, I'm going to play a video from Peter Schaft. He is the um, uh, the jazz curator at uh, the Lincoln Center, and uh, he gives a great explanation on the kind of um, situation that is happening that creates, uh, that helps to create jazz music uh, in New Orleans. So I'm going to play this. And there's the treatment of the slaves and the continuance of, and it's very unusual, of African practices as an allowed, not so much celebration, but activity for the slaves on their so-called day off Sunday as long as they embrace Christianity. And maybe you haven't really centered your attention on it. There's African custom in the United States. After 1803, New Orleans is part of the U.S. It's the slave period still, and there's this stuff going on, African ritual, music, custom, on display. Anybody could go in New Orleans every Sunday, 52 times a year. 520 times per decade, decade after decade. And that really puts a different stamp on New Orleans. So as he explained this, 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 this African stuff going on in New Orleans helps to create this kind of foundation for what now we call jazz music. So meanwhile, also in um, Congo Square, uh, while they're dancing and drumming and having uh, a good time, there's also rituals, uh, spiritual rituals taking place. Um, so Again, this constant influx of new Africans into New Orleans and this practice of new or uh, these enslaved Africans having a day off, being allowed to congregate on Sunday and being Catholicized. And that becomes important. So 
to understand the practice of voodoo. Voodoo is the descendant of the West African spiritual tradition known as Ifa, mainly practiced by the Yoruba people found in places like Nigeria. Now, to understand voodoo, you have to understand Ifa and to understand uh, voodoo and how it worked with Catholicism, you have to understand Ifa. Now, I'm going to give a very abrupt, aborted, and not thorough exam uh, uh, explanation or definition of Ifa. So, uh, those who may be practitioners, please don't get on here and say, that ain't how it is. That's, you didn't left all this out. I'm, for the purpose of this presentation, the important part is that Ifa um, believes that certain spiritual entities interact in the life of human beings, mankind, and appeasement or uh, of these entities can have them interact with you in a positive way or in a negative way. So that's a very simple, sophomoric, elementary explanation of it. But the important part to understand is this synchronism, syncretism that takes place. I'm sorry, syncretism that takes place between Catholicism and um, Ifa. So because the, the official practice of Ifa was outlawed, it was against the law. Again, all of the enslaved Africans had to be Catholicized, had to become Catholics. Um, the ingenious nature of the African again kicks in and he found ways to uh, uh, venerate these uh, spiritual entities of Ifa by finding um, the characteristics of certain Catholic saints that had similar attributes as these, these spirits, right? As these entities. So whereas the French thought um, the African, the enslaved African was venerating St. Mary or St. Joe or, or whatever other saint, they were actually using the attributes of that saint to venerate um, Ifa spiritual entities. So that is how voodoo forms in New Orleans, or voodoo forms in New Orleans. After the Haitian Revolution, there is an influx of Haitians from um, from Haiti uh, who 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 came with their uh, slave owners uh, and other free people of color uh, into Louisiana, which was the nearest French colony, and these uh, Haitians were also practitioners of Ifa. So there, that influx helped to bolster, right? Helped to bolster the uh, faith practice in New Orleans. Uh, this woman you're looking at, her name is Marie Laveau, and she is actually a famous voodoo priestess. Um, and you remember I mentioned people of color, right? Free people of color. She was a free person of color in uh, New Orleans. So now... Shotgun, shoot him for a run. Bam, bam, bam. Right. So the shotgun home in New Orleans um, is another example of the results of kind of this cultural preservation uh, that these Africans uh, in New Orleans uh, use. So the, 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 the shotgun, shotgun home uh, is a home that has the front door and the back door aligned creating a home that has uh, um, uh, sequential rooms, um, but no hallways, all right? And the shotgun home comes to New Orleans via those Haitians. And the shotgun home that Haiti, that was in Haiti, came from um, the Yoruba people of West Africa. It originates in West Africa. Uh, 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 it is written that the shotgun home of Haiti quite directly became the shotgun home of New Orleans. And why do they call them shotgun homes? Because the idea is that you can stand at the front door and shoot a gun uh, out the back door without hitting a wall. Again, there's no hallways in uh, a shotgun home. So this these homes are dotted throughout New Orleans. And it is an example of African cultural preservation. They literally brought 
their homes or the style of homes from West Africa and planted them in New Orleans. Now, as I mentioned, um, um, New Orleans became the Walmart of slavery. You could find any type of slave you wanted. You wanted a, 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 a field hand, bam, you got you a field hand. You wanted an artisan, bam, you got you an artisan. You wanted a cook, bam, you got you a cook. You wanted a cleaner, you could go to New Orleans. It was literally the Walmart of enslaved Africans. One of the one of the most in demand types of enslaved Africans were iron workers, iron workers. Right. Um, and there are two books. Um, one is called um, one is called. Um, um, the Negro Iron Workers in New Orleans from 1718 to 1900 by Marcus Christian. And the uh, second one is called uh, um, African Symbols and the Works of Black Iron Workers in New Orleans from 1800 to 1863 by Eva Martin, published by Temple University Press. These two books outlined another, the ingenuity of, uh, of of enslaved Africans, another example of the ingenuity of enslaved Africans. These iron workers would um, all across New Orleans, understand, there are these balconies, especially in the French Quarter, which is like the oldest part of New Orleans. You see these balconies and these railings or porches. You see these metal railings or on uh, uh, um um, handrails as you're going up the steps you see all of this wrought iron work wrought iron work right and you see designs in these work you may see designs in these work and to the naked eye it doesn't mean anything it's just designs to make it look aesthetically pleasing however this is the ingenuity of the african these africans hid and Dinkra, a Dinkra and Dinkra symbols within, not even hit them, they're in plain sight within the wrought iron work. So a Dinkra symbols are symbols that originate in Ghana and they are used to represent um, um, uh, uh, um, uh, they're used to represent a complex idea or an, uh, an, an aphorism, right? So if we look here, this symbol is called Sankofa, Sankofa. And it means to like remember the past or go back and get it, right? Go back and get it, a uh, way of saying remember the past. And remember that building that I said was in the background on the Congo Square, right? Photo, it looked like it had three buildings with a tall building in the middle. St. Louis Cathedral. This is St. Louis Cathedral. Atop of the left steeple and the right steeple of St. Louis Cathedral is a Sankofa, an Adinkra print. The enslaved African who built this church and built that steeple decided to put an uh, Adinkra, the, the Sankofa, on each side. And I know it was hard to see, but there it is. There it is, right? And it means return and get it. Return and get it. Remember your past. And it is not lost on me that after being forced to being in a member of the Catholic Church, forced into Catholicism, <clears throat> that this, I can just think of that, the, the African that created this Sankofa that was actually working the ironwork to make this Sankofa, thinking to himself, I will not forget my past. So even on the largest Catholic church, when I have to pass by this, I can look up and remember, remember my past and return and get it. Here you see the Sankofas up and down a porch or a balcony directly across from uh, St. Louis Cathedral. This is another uh, Adinkra symbol called the ram's horn. And you can see it here. 
at 50, uh, 521 Dolphin Street, which is in the French Quarter. You can see the, the symbol there. Now, mind you, these symbols are all over New Orleans. This wrought iron work is all over New Orleans. In fact, this is um, the ram's horn with Sankofas around it, right? So, again, cultural preservation, uh, resistance through cultural preservation, resistance through cultural preservation. These, these Africans are creating jazz music. That's cultural preservation. They're creating homes, right? Homes that, that look like the homes that they built in West Africa, cultural preservation. They're, they're practicing and, and creating a new spiritual practice called voodoo or voodoo, and that's cultural preservation, right? To keep themselves as close to the African or as close to Africa as possible. So, in a given Monday in the city of New Orleans, right, the red beans and rice is the dish on the top of the menu of just about every restaurant you go to. Now, red beans and rice, the dish came to New Orleans via enslaved Africans from Haiti, right? Who were integrated into uh, the enslaved Africans in New Orleans. Again, they were from the same areas. They're, they're French, they're, they're, their enslavers were the French. So, uh, as well as they had all been forced to, to convert to Catholicism. And they all and, and many of them practice Ifa. So these were like cousins who came together and formed what we now call New Orleans, right? What we now call the Black history and the Black population or the African Americans who live in New Orleans. So the red beans and rice comes to New Orleans via the Haitians. But the dish, while in Haiti, red beans were a substitute for the dish of Black, black eyed peas is what, what they call them, black eyed peas and rice. The idea of beans and rice, beans and rice is found throughout West Africa. It originates in West Africa, the idea of a bean dish and a rice dish as a combination. The enslaved Africans in Haiti did not have access to black eyed peas, I guess at the time, and red beans became the substitute and they brought that into New Orleans and now that is a staple of New Orleans culture. Um, for those who, who are unfamiliar, again, if red beans are synonymous with New Orleans, then gumbo is 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 the uh is 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 the twin of red beans and rice, right? Uh gumbo is a dish that comes from the word in gumbo, in gumbo. Uh, which is a West African word that that um, um, that uh, that means okra, right? So the West Africans who came into New Orleans brought this gumbo dish with them, and some forms of okra are um, are made with uh, okra, like the original gumbo is made with okra when. When the French influence came, um, there there was a different way of thickening. So the, the 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 okra was used as a way of thickening the stew. So gumbo is a big pot of stew. It's 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 a lot of meat, crabs and seafood, and uh, sometimes chicken and sausage. All of this put into a pot, uh, and the okra was used to thicken it. Um, uh, many African American. Uh, culinary experts adopted the way of the French um, that that used uh, flour and uh, fat or flour and oil as a thickener. So now most gumbo that you taste in New Orleans is based, is roux. That's what they call a roux when you mix the flour and the oil together. That's a roux. And that is used as a thickener for the gumbo. But originally it was the okra. Um, the, 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 um, the dish has been influenced by French. Some people say it's been influenced by Native Americans, but at the root of the dish is a West African, um, um, uh, cultural tradition. It's a cultural culinary, uh, tradition. Now, I wanted to get here because 
some things don't really need a lot of talking and explanation to see the connection. But in West Africa, mainly in parts of Nigeria, the idea that death is final and a somber event um, is not viewed that way. Uh, parts of Nigeria, there's a celebratory uh, aspect to a funeral. Um, so about 400 years ago, the roots for what New Orleanians call a jazz funeral um, started with the Dahomeans the, the uh, of Benin and the Yoruba people of Nigeria in West Africa. Um, they, they, they believed that the deceased had to have a proper burial. So they would pull their money together, pull their resources, not necessarily money, but resource, money, resources together uh, to ensure that the deceased of, of their society would have a proper burial. And oftentimes these burials would look like celebratory uh, uh, situations, right? A celebratory event um uh with drumming and the carrying of caskets um throughout the village as a, a a way of honoring the dead the enslaved africans who came into new orleans brought those traditions with them not only the tradition of uh the funeral service but also the tradition of pooling money together right uh in order to ensure that a family friend or a brother or a member of your society would be able to, and I'm, when I say society, I mean, if I'm speaking of an organization like uh, uh, benevolent societies is what they would call them, right? That would pull the money together to ensure that those who are part of this group, this organization would have a decent burial. And um, that, that the proper burial as well as to have the celebratory aspects of that burial. So now I'm going to play you two video clips. One is of a Nigerian funeral that took place, you know, recently, well, present day. Uh, then I'll show you a video clip of a New Orleans funeral.
So that is the end. I was having all kind of technical difficulties here uh, with my Zoom and and stuff. I was having all kind of stuff. So it's pause, pausing, stop, recording, stop, whatever have you. But hopefully you guys got the gist of the presentation and you can see the African cultural practices that still exist in New Orleans. And this is what I call cultural preservation. Uh, I call it resistance through cultural preservation. So I will stop here and hopefully you guys enjoyed it.